Welcome to another episode of the David Mead Podcast. On today's episode, we have Taylor Clement. Taylor, welcome to the podcast. Hi, thank you for having me. So you've been through a lot of shit throughout your life. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that's one way to put it. <laughs> yep, a lot more than most, most people I know. And yep. yet you've come out the other side and inspired a lot of other people, and, well, and my, my, myself included. Oh, thank you. I want to talk a bit about uh, how you made that journey across. Um, we spoke mm-hmm. briefly yesterday on, and I, and I asked how I could introduce you, yeah, uh, because you're my quote unquote quote uh, first stranger on the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I was going through your bio yesterday, and I saw on your Instagram it said uh, the girl who can't smile. Before we talk about your um, upbringing, can you tell us a bit about mm-hmm. the condition you were born with? Yeah. Um, so I was born with an extremely rare neurological disorder. Um, it's called Mebius or Nobius syndrome. Um, and it affects my sixth and seventh cranial nerves. So basically that means I have facial paralysis. So my eyebrows don't move, my eyes don't track from left to right, and my upper lip doesn't move, which means I can't smile. Hence the Instagram bio, bio the girl who can't smile. Um, and the syndrome is so rare that it affects um, one person in every three to four million. So it's super, super rare. You can't smile with uh, facial expression, but I can tell you what, um, seeing a lot of the videos that you've um, spoken on on YouTube, yeah, uh, you certainly put a lot of smiles on other people's faces and uh, you've got a lot of uh, smile from your heart. So Thank you. Uh, it's certainly very inspiring. <laughs> Thank you. I also like to refer to it as free Botox. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so where were you born uh, in, New- in New Zealand and what was it like was- growing up there? Yeah, so I was born and raised in Christchurch, New Zealand, so in the South Island, um, and moved away from Christchurch to the Kapiti Coast, which is like an hour from Wellington, um, around the age of eight, uh, and then moved from Wellington to Tauranga, which is in the Bay of Plenty, um, in the kind of middle of the North Island, um, when I was 11 or yeah, just before my 11th birthday, um, and then lived in Tauranga for four years, and then have been up in Auckland um, since I was 16. So yeah, moved around quite a bit, um, and as you can <laughs> probably assume, moving around a bit and starting new schools isn't easy for anyone, regardless of um, what you look like or um, whatever it is, um, but when you have that added extra of not being able to I guess smile at people or make those initial kind of connections with people through facial expression um it can be a bit harder (laughs) um and yeah so I was bullied from a really young age um pretty much ever since I can remember really and yeah do you want me to get going to the bullying because I feel (laughs) Um, that's probably what you were hinting at (laughs) uh, I've got some questions here for you but okay um, (laughs) Before we talk about the bullying stuff, mm-hmm. um, what do you remember your earliest memories? What were some of the fun and exciting things to do where you were born? Um, I've <laughs> always been a water baby. Like I loved the water. Um, my mum was a, a NZ rep for surf life saving water polo and swimming. So I feel like there was just always going to be a non-negotiable whether I loved it or not. But um, New Zealand, we're really lucky in New Zealand because we're pretty much all close to water and the ocean and um, still to this day I love the ocean like I'm such a summer summer person I love summer I love being by the water um so you're definitely going to the beach on the weekends for surf club like nippers I'm not they I'm pretty sure they have like nippers in Australia I'm not sure it's called nippers so I could be mistaken it's there, nippers, but it's like, yeah 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 they're called yeah. nippers um yeah, I've so, never been into it so I'm not too familiar yeah. with it yeah, so it was just like all these like little kids running around the sand causing havoc and <laughs> throwing sand at each other. Um, but yeah, no, that was super fun. Um, and that's probably one of my earliest like good memories. Yeah. Yep. And so from then on, uh, when did you re- kind of realize the uh, bullying was starting? Do you remember that? Um. I would say I kind of realized maybe there was something different about me when I would like go to the supermarket with my mum. And this was like super young as well, like maybe four or five. 
um, and my mum would like stop people from staring at me and like she's super passive aggressive my mum bless her <laughs> but she would like stop people in the supermarket and I like should either like confront them if they were staring or she'd be like my daughter has this this and this righty righty right and like she'd start a conversation with them about it and some people were like open to have the conversation if I can correctly and some just weren't so um but yeah that was probably my first kind of memory of realizing I was a bit different than others yeah it must have been yeah. like um pretty frustrating for your mum feeling like she had to explain herself because yeah 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 it, um I can't imagine what it would have been like for her because like I said the syndrome's one in every three to four million so when I was first diagnosed like she told me that she went on to all the American websites for Mebius because obviously America's got like a way bigger population than New Zealand has got and I don't think I mean there still aren't that many people with Mebius in New Zealand currently um but there was always going to be like a bigger population of people with the syndrome in the state so she said she would like go onto the forums and everything um but yeah it, I can't imagine what it would be like for parents to like have a child that is like different and they don't know kind of how to deal with it but my parents are super chill and like um just I think they've done it so well they always say that <laughs> they're not the best parents but like I love my parents so much and yeah like they're both my best friends and just really thankful for how they've brought me up as a person because I think that comes back to who I am today as well and how I've been able to deal I guess with having the syndrome and yeah. did your mum find uh, she obviously found some did her homework and found some more information that must have given her some form of, uh, I guess, how would you say, comfort knowing well, that there's other yeah, people dealing yeah. with that as well. And yeah, is- I feel like it's yeah, I feel like it's the same for everyone. If you've got something that you're dealing with, the first thing you want to do is find someone else that maybe has dealt with what you um, are dealing with, and kind of take take kind of inspiration from them and how they've dealt with it. Um, but yeah, it, um, yeah, I take my head off to her. <laughs> I don't. I'm not sure if I could have done it. <laughs> <laughs> With the bullying in in school, uh, mm-hmm. it must have been pretty hard. How do you think, um, or do you remember how you used to deal with it? It must have been very upsetting. Uh, I would say I didn't deal with it well because I didn't tell anyone. Um, I like didn't really even tell my mum or my dad really until I was out of school, and they still don't know half the stuff that I went through just because I don't want them to have to feel bad or like they could have done anything because there was nothing that they could have done and it's just there's not really much point in me telling them because yeah I just don't want them to feel bad like they're amazing parents so um, I'd rather just keep that to myself and keep it for podcasts like this to like to be um, educational for other people and yeah. When you say you uh, you didn't talk to anyone about it um, were you, were you... Uh, obviously affected by uh, a lot of mm-hmm. the bullying growing yeah, up. Yeah, hundred percent. Yeah, um, I guess I'm trying to get this out in a way where, like, if other kids are getting bullied at school, mm-hmm. don't do be? what I did. <laughs> yeah. Don't do what I did. Definitely talk about it um, with someone that you trust. Um, your so for me, the reason kind of why at the time I didn't tell my parents about what I was going through is because one of the things I would get told like maybe not daily but you know at least definitely weekly at times was that my parents didn't love me or that I was a mistake or that um, I shouldn't be alive and so when you're like a really young kid and you've already gone through all this like bullying and and exclusion um, and then you're getting told that your parents don't love you or that you're a mistake on top of that you don't have that kind of maturity um, in terms of like mindset to be able to differentiate between what's true and what isn't. Um, so for me, I believe that my parents didn't love me and that took me down um, a pretty dark path um, along with everything else that I went through. But um, yeah, it was super hard for me to feel like my parents didn't love me, but they obviously did. <laughs> Um, But to anyone that is being bullied like right now or will be bullied in the future um, or who who is going through something now that they feel like they can't talk to anyone about, um, you 100% can talk about it. And the more you talk about it, 
um but it gets a hundred percent easier like even just talking about it for the first time like it's I know how hard it is to like open up to people when you feel like you're dealing with something on your own um that you're not alone by any means um and it, like you can't you can't deal with it by yourself like it's impossible to deal with such negativity on your own and the more you open up to people like a hundred percent gets so much easier for sure a hundred percent agree with yeah. that just out of curiosity how, how bad did the bullying get because um okay so i made a promise to myself when i um started on this journey of i guess quote unquote inspiring people that i was going to leave nothing unsaid <laughs> um so i'm going to go into it like in full detail and you can stop me at any point if you think it get if it gets a bit too much uh, this um, is your this is your show taylor you <laughs> say as much as you want um so the bullying started pretty much when I entered school I had friends when I was in primary and lived in Christchurch and everything because I'd seen me growing up you know going to kindergarten with these kids and when you're a bit younger you don't really care too much about well about what other people look like right you kind of just go with the flow all you want to do is go to school have fun and eat your lunch and play games um so it was all kind of good in um Christchurch um got called a few names here and there but nothing to like write home about when I moved um, from Christchurch to the Kakadi Coast um, around the age of eight or nine, that's when I started experiencing a lot of exclusion and not being like invited to people's houses or um, I found it really hard to make friends when I moved um, that first time. Um, and the friends that I did have, um, people would like tell them to not be friends with me because I looked different or that I couldn't smile or that I was weird. Um, and so that was kind of like my first real taste of like kind of proper bullying, I guess. And then when I moved to Tauranga, um a couple of years after that, that's when the bullying got really bad. So I had an operation, um, a really invasive operation uh, just after I turned 11. And the operation was supposed to be able to make me smile. So they took tissue from the right side of my leg and they... Uh, inserted it internally in the insides of my mouth from the corners of my mouth up into my temple. So the idea was that I'd be able to clench down my teeth and that the tissue inserted would pull up the corners of my mouth to smile. And of course, like I wanted it so badly. All I wanted was to be able to smile because in my head I was like, if I can smile then I won't be bullied anymore. Um, and the operation was unsuccessful. Um, and it was six or seven months after that, that when I took the first of what would be six attempts on my life because I was, to be quite honest, I don't think I realised what I was doing because it was such a young age to want to do something like that. But I was so like disheartened and depressed that I couldn't smile and I was already going through so much and um, I'd started a new school that year because when you um, turn 12 in New Zealand that's the end of primary school so then you go into intermediate in high school um, so started a new school with like my face like out to here like I had the swelling didn't go down for like a good year um, and I can send you pictures or like send you links to put over like the youtube video whatever um if you want me to and because it's it's a it's an interesting visual <laughs> to look at um but i started this new school with like bruised face bruised under eyes like face like looking like a puffer fish and if you thought like not being able to smile was <laughs> enough going and starting a new school looking like that and then also not being able to smile like still not being able to smile after the operation it not only like broke me as a 12, like 11, 12 year old kid, but it also made other people not want to be friends with me. I remember my mum coming into school halfway through that year during a lunchtime and I didn't know she was coming and I was sitting by myself because I didn't have any friends and I was eating my lunch and mum goes, oh, where's like all your friends? And I was like, oh, they're coming, they're coming from class. They're just a bit late. Um, and that's kind of when the whole lying started for me about like what I was going through to my parents. And I just, I felt like it was easier than telling the truth, which it a hundred percent wasn't. And again, I'll say it again, like tell the truth, like let people know what you're going through. But, um, yeah, that kind of is what started the whole not telling people what I was going through. 
end of that year so year seven going into year eight is when the physical bullying started so people would come up behind me and rip my bag off my back or and they'd like take all my school books out of my bag and throw them everywhere and they would um, take my lunch box out of my bag and like throw my throw my lunch everywhere, and I'd be like, you know what? You can take my bag, you can take my school books, just for God's sakes, don't take my lunch. <laughs> your girl needs your food. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, but yeah, so that happened, and then um, people would like come up behind me when I would be walking upstairs, and they would like kick my knee in from behind, so I'd fall over. So I have like these grazes and scars on my knees from that and it happened so many times that I ended up tearing my meniscus um in my left knee because you know I got to a point where I knew it was going to happen um and so the force of me like kind of hyperextending my knee and then kicking it like tore my meniscus like completely and the doctor when I went to him was like oh how did you do this and I was like oh I was like running <laughs> which is like such a lie because I don't run like if <laughs> I hate running <laughs> um but uh yeah so that happened and I'd get pushed down hills and our school that I was on at this time was like on farmland and so people would like get sheep poo and like throw sheep poo at me which is like the most kiwi thing ever <laughs> um but yeah and then end of that year going into the following year, so end of year eight going into year nine is when I started experiencing rape and sexual assault for the first time. So that happened over the span of um, two years. Um, so from then until when I left Tauranga. And um, I had no idea what rape or sexual assault was at that age. Um, I don't think anyone really did at that age. I All I knew what rape and sexual assault was was from the movie. So I thought it was like you get kidnapped and blindfolded and thrown into a back of a truck and raped and then killed I didn't know anything different um and so that was a huge part of my recovery process which I'm sure we'll get into later and then uh yeah just just like name calling of like being told my parents didn't love me getting barked at by people called, being called a dog being called a pig um ugly all this sort of stuff and um, I remember this one time I got asked over to like a um, sleepover party and it was in the middle of summer so like we were all going to sleep outside in tents and everything so we were like asked to bring a um, sleeping bag and everything and like I was so excited because this was like one of my first ever sleepovers I must have been about 15 um, at the time and uh, I rocked, mum dropped me off rocked up to the house and knocked on the door and like a couple of girls came to the door and they were all like giggling and talking between themselves and um I knew something wasn't right <laughs> um and then I was like I'm here for the sleepover and then they're like oh you weren't invited and I was like oh but I got the invitation they're like oh you weren't invited <laughs> and they like laughed and shut the door in my face so I didn't want to text mum and tell her that I wasn't invited because then I'd have to tell her everything else. So I walked down the road and slept um, in a bus shelter that night and then just told my mum that I'd walk home um, the following day so I wouldn't have to, like, tell her what was going on. So, you know, that kind of happened a couple of times after that. Um, and just – and then groups of girls that I'd be friends with or, like, quote, unquote, friends with would, like, get guy, guys to pretend to be into me um, and – invite me out on dates and everything and then no one would show up and they would like be there and taking pictures of me and put them on these like Facebook groups um that they've made and um yeah so just like a lot of that and then moving away from Tauranga um was up in Auckland for my last three years of school um and I was up here for the first year by myself with my dad um, and then mum and my other sister came up at the end of that first year. I was up here by myself and I kind of was just like done. <laughs> I was done with school at that point um, and wagged a lot, um, lied about where I was sometimes. <laughs> I laugh about it now because it's so stupid, but sometimes I would like literally just leave school and go across the road and sit under a tree. Like I could like physic like the school was like probably 20 metres away from me and I'd just be sitting there just like chilling under a tree. <laughs> just like sweet like people don't even know I'm here and like I'm obviously in a school uniform um but yeah so I don't condone wagging school at all yeah. but like <laughs> I that's just kind of the mindset I was in like I didn't like I was so traumatized um and then 2015 was my last year of school 
Um, and that's kind of when everything started to take a real, real downhill turn for me. Um, it was about maybe a quarter of the way through the schooling year, I want to say. Um, and I started just having these collapsing episodes and seizures. So um, I had one or two at school. And then after I had my one or two, they asked me to leave school. And because apparently I was a risk to other students. But in my head, I was like, yes, like I don't have to go to school anymore. This is like it. This is like the dream come true for me. <laughs> Um, but um, I was in and out of hospital all of 2015 and into 2016. And basically, they did all these tests on me. They thought I was um, like had a brain aneurysm. They thought there's something wrong with my heart because I was like having up at one point up to eight or nine seizures a day, um, which was like Jeez. super dangerous in itself. Yeah, like it was, it got really, really bad um, for a while there. And I think it was about, March or April of 2016 where I was finally diagnosed with extreme clinical depression, anxiety with post-traumatic stress disorder and disassociative attacks or Addisonia's crisis which is um, usually only diagnosed in patients who su suffer, um, who are in severe car accidents um, or who go through um, trauma out of nowhere but because my trauma that I'd been through with like my bullying and the depression and everything um, had gone on for so long and was so extreme um, I was diagnosed with Addisonian's crisis or disassociative attacks which is um, when your cortisol levels are so low and cortisol is the hormone that is your fight or flight response so like when you're faced with like a anxiety driven situation or you're in a situation where you have to kind of fight or flight um that's when your cortisol levels um kick in but because mine was so low and almost non-existent um my brain was shutting down um because it obviously had no fight or flight response so instead I was having seizures <laughs> um so that I was told that I was never gonna recover from those I was told that I was going to have seizures for the rest of my life and um here we are today and um I haven't, haven't had a seizure in like two years and pretty much fully recovered still deal with a little bit of anxiety from time to time but um I'm pretty much all good yeah wow that's um <laughs> geez, I, don't know. <laughs> um, I mean if, if, if that's how I I'm feeling like wow that's a lot to deal with uh, especially as a kid, uh, teenager, yeah. dealing with all that yeah. type of stuff. Um, I do believe everything happens for a reason, though, and although it was, like, really hard for me, um, and I wouldn't wish it upon anyone at all in this world, um, I believe that I went through it for a reason, and this is one of those reasons to, like, talk with you and inspire your community to yeah. um, talk about mental health and just kind of inspire people to realise that you only get one life and um don't take it for granted at all and it really doesn't matter like what you look like or where you come from or what the color of your skin is or whatever it is that you think might stop you like you can achieve anything you want to achieve and that's what I really like am so passionate about so yeah, yeah I wouldn't take it back for the world when you were talking to you, your family about this I know you mentioned earlier you haven't they don't know everything yeah. but when you started telling them um they must have been pretty upset by it how oh did yeah. You, how did you um, all deal with it? Yeah, well, my mum um was pretty easy to talk to about it. She's um a real like carefree <laughs> type of person. Like she's really go with the flow. Like she um nothing really phases her and um I know anyone can get mental health issues or deal with depression or anxiety, but she's just one of those people that I just don't feel like could ever be depressed she's just like super like always pretty happy and chill and go with the flow whereas um my dad it was super hard to talk to him about um especially like the rape and sexual assault because he just retired last year after 42 years in the police um and he was at he was quite a high level in the New Zealand police as well um and we're very similar my dad and I like <laughs> if I was if I was born a boy I think I would have been like a spitting image of him. Um, but we have very similar mindsets in the way we think and um, the way we go about life. And it was, yeah, pretty hard to talk to him about, um, especially the sexual assault and rape, just because he's dealt with stuff like that before. And I think as a parent, you always think that it could never happen to your child or your child's always going to be safe from all the stuff. But um, 
yeah, it was super hard to talk to him about, but um, I think we just get each other without having to um, talk too much about stuff, which is really nice. But I know that um, if I really needed to talk to him about something, then he would always be there. And But yeah, I think they were pretty in shock. And every time I talk to my sister about it, she's just like, you just wouldn't have known. You just wouldn't have known that that's what I was going through because I just, I like tried my best to make sure no one knew that that is what I was going through because I didn't want to be, I don't know, I don't like to cause anyone like any like um, sadness or like I don't want to like upset people or anything. So um, I just wanted to make sure that everyone else was fine before I was fine. So, and I'm still like that today, but I'm very aware of where I'm at now. So that's kind of the difference between younger Taylor and this Taylor. <laughs> yeah. And from turning your pain into your power, mm-hmm. uh, when I was reading in your um, bio, mm-hmm. can you give us an example or two how you were able to turn your pain into your power? Mm-hmm. Give us so example. one one of yeah, so one of the biggest things um, is my smile. Um, so when I was 11 and had that operation, the only thing I wanted was to be able to smile because it had already caused me so much pain. Um, up until that point and then it continued to cause me pain after the operation was unsuccessful Um, but looking back on it now one I understand why the operation was unsuccessful in my head and two I'm very grateful that it was unsuccessful because my smile is what makes me me and I feel so empowered that I I like had something to show people that it's like okay, if I can do it, then so can you, you know, like, I'm not any different from anyone else, I'm not special, I've just been able to go through something, or go through a lot of things, and come out the other side, and I guess my smile has enabled me to um, do what I do today, and that's kind of like my biggest source of turning pain into power, and um, people probably think I'm crazy, but um, I'd go through it all again if I had to because um it is so empowering to be able to stand here like as the woman that I am today after going through so much and be like you know what it happened it's the past right now is kind of all we have and if I can use what I've been through to help others then that's what I'm going to do and that's what I know that I'm here to do so yeah what does power feel like to you you excited uh, not scared anymore you feel free um I wouldn't call it power I kind of just use pain into power as like kind of the sentence but I'd call it more empowerment yep. I think um empowerment feels pretty much like you can do anything or that you can achieve anything really like um it's really weird because I used to walk up um Mount Monganui which is in Tauranga where I used to live for a bit um and where a lot of the bullying happened um and I would walk up this mount um and with my family sometimes or sometimes just with my dad or my mum and they would go do their own thing and I'd like (laughs) this is gonna sound so cheesy but I'd stand on like the edge of the mountain like looking out across the ocean and the only thing I would pray for or ask for or wish for was to be happy like that's all I wanted like as a 13 14 15 year old kid like that's all I wanted. I just wanted the bullying to stop and I just wanted to be happy. So to be able to stand here and say that, like, I truly am, like, the happiest person ever and, like, the confidence that I have and um, the ability to connect with people um, as well, like, it's just, it's truly such a gift to be able to turn what I've been through into empowerment um, and it's really special and I don't ever take it for granted at all. Yeah, yeah that's a that's a although you wish that you know none of those things happen to anyone you know, for you're you're a living example of someone who can you know, take their situation and um turn it into a positive and and i yeah. I hope that this conversation gets heard um throughout a lot of places uh, oh. especially in p and g because you know and I know there's a lot of ish, social issues there there's a lot yeah. of problems mm-hmm. there and um I just don't know if the help is out there and available yeah and I hope yeah and this is also why I do stuff like this as well because some people feel like they don't know where to reach out to they don't know where to start they don't know how to talk about what they're going through and all you've got to do is just start like you you know there's never going to be a right time there's never going to be a right place 
to start, but you've just got to do it because the more time you waste feeling all these negative emotions, the more you're going to bring yourself down and also the more of your life that you're wasting. You know, like we're not supposed to be sad and depressed all the time. Like there's so much, like to be alive in itself is just a blessing. So um, I think it's really important that people understand that they like need to talk about how they're feeling even if you're not feeling depressed or anxious or anything like just talk about how you're feeling and making it sort of like the norm um is super powerful as well yeah for sure i, I agree with that yeah. i spoke to you uh, i saw a little bit brief in your bio and i spoke to you a little bit briefly yesterday um you enjoy doing some form of meditation yeah i guess for me that's yeah. uh that's a way i um I wouldn't say I deal with problems, but that's how I feel sometimes empowered. Yeah. I guess because mm-hmm. I'm less reactive, um, you know, either sitting upright or um, laying down, I'll close my eyes for yeah. 10, 15 mm-hmm. minutes and just try and uh, see yeah. my thoughts pass. Uh, yeah. And I find that that helps me with, mm-hmm. you know, dealing with the kids screaming all afternoon or you know, <laughs> driving and someone's cutting me off. <laughs> yes. did, did, did you use, That's so funny. Yeah, well, yeah, it happens a lot. Um, <laughs> I, try, I try to use meditation for a lot of things. A, a lot of things, <laughs> especially screaming kids. Is that is that one way you were able to deal with a lot of your things? Because I see meditation is um, uh, how would you put it? It's, it's becoming more and more common to talk about. Yeah, mm-hmm. um, and more and more done a lot more now. It's somewhere it's something I want to explore. And you said you had had a huge interest in this area as well. Yeah, 100%. I think um, one, there's a couple of places where people kind of get put off um, meditation. One is the fact that it's called meditation and it sounds like super like weird. Um, But if you don't want to look at it that way, just look at it as breath work because that's essentially what it is. It's focusing on your breath and all of that. And the second reason why people find it so hard to meditate or do breath work is because they think they're an overthinker and they find it hard to switch off um and I'm 100% that sort of person like I'm such an overthinker and it's something that I'm getting a lot better at but the reason I didn't get into meditation for so long was because I thought oh I'm an overthinker and I'm never going to be able to switch my thoughts off and that's like the whole wrong idea of people have about meditation meditation isn't about switching your thoughts off it's about being able to go to a really calm and zen place and just be the observer of your thoughts rather than running around like a headless chicken (laughs) and also having these like millions and trillions of thoughts going around in your head all at one time and being able to go into a place even if it's for like three minutes like if you feel like you can't do it just set a timer for three minutes and just really focus on your breath like in through your nose out through your mouth and just focus on your breath and watch how calm you are when you come out of it and as you get better and better at it you can you know put the time up and up but um the more I got into meditation the more I was able to observe kind of the thoughts and beliefs and feelings that I was allowing myself to believe and it all comes back to mindset like this all ties back into mindset and and I'm like huge on mindset mindset is the thing that kind of got me out of my depression and anxiety and really get me to a place where I am today of empowerment and confidence in myself and what I want to achieve. Um, But when you meditate, you're able to kind of hear what you're telling yourself on a daily basis. And sometimes you don't even realize that you're telling yourself these thoughts and your reality, like what we're living right now is a direct reflection of what you think and allow yourself to believe. You know, so you could be, um, and this is like from like when you grow up as a child as well, you know, the the way you've been brought up, the stories that you hear as you're growing up from like teachers or parents or um, limiting beliefs that you get from the media or whatever it is, you know, we've all been conditioned to think a certain way and live a certain way and be a certain way. Um, and when you take control of that, that's when you start living like your best life and you get the most out of life and you become, um, I guess, who you want to be, if that makes sense. Well, I think it's certainly a helpful tool. I think, uh, you know, if someone uh, like you is, who's experienced uh, the bad experience you had in your teenage years, mm. if meditation is something you endorse, I think it's uh, certainly <laughs> well worth looking yeah. into. 
uh, by yeah. people out there. Yeah. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about uh, participating in the Paralympics. Yeah. That must have been pretty exciting. <laughs> yeah, so it wasn't – so I never um, – so I was a Paralympic athlete um, and I competed for New Zealand um, uh, in swimming and shot put and discus. Okay. Um, so people get really confused because the Paralympics is like – the Olympics, but for people who have disabilities, right? Yep. Um, but being a Paralympic athlete um, and going to the Paralympics are two different things. Yeah. But okay. so I was a Paralympic athlete, and I never got around to going to the Paralympics. But we will get into that. Okay. But um, so I quit swimming when I was um about nineteen and and competed for New Zealand, um, uh, overseas. Went to the Pan Pacific Games, which is like a which is sort of like a mini Olympics. It's got all of the countries apart from like Europe. So Spain and England and stuff like that don't go, but the Americas go and um, all of those sort of countries um, and competed in Australia heats, went to heats of Australian national championships. Um, did pretty well. Um, nothing like had a few New Zealand records and, and Oceania records and um, all that, but then had to quit when I was 19 due to the mental health um, stuff. And then, I was supposed to like be focusing fully on my recovery, but because I'm like a super fidgety person and can't really sit still, <laughs> um, I uh, was given an opportunity to give shot put a go, and I was like, "Why not? I've got nothing else to do." Literally, all I was doing was going to therapy every week and kind of talking about my feelings, which got a bit <laughs> dragged out quite a bit um, after a while. So this was like um, 2016, but at the end of 2016. So rocked up to this athletics track, went into the middle where the shot put kind of place was. And the guy that I was standing there with, he was just like, okay, just do what you did in primary school, throw the shot put and we'll see how it goes. So I stood in the shot put circle and he was like, just throw it. And I was like, okay. So I just did it. And he stood there and kind of like his jaw dropped a little bit and said nothing and just went straight onto his phone. And I was like standing there, I was like, well, can someone tell me what's going on, please? Because I don't know what's happening. <laughs> um, and I didn't know if it was good at anything, but he got on his phone, texted someone and like three other people came over from the national head office um, like five minutes after that. And he was like, okay, throw it again. And I was like, well, now there's a lot of pressure because there are more people here. <laughs> um, so I gave it a throw and they measured it and they were like, Taylor, you just broke the New Zealand record in your classification. And I was like, oh, sweet. Like, that's pretty cool. Um, and so they're like, do you know, like sign up to a club and like give it a go? And I was like, yeah, okay. And then that same day I got a call back and they're like, oh, you're going to go on to the New Zealand team to Australia next year in Melbourne. Um to get your international classification and compete and I was like oh no thank you <laughs> I was like that's not gonna happen <laughs> um because I was still like struggling so much with my anxiety at this point and I was like and because like my parents couldn't come with me and I was like there's no way there's no way that that's happening anyway February of the of 2017 rocks around and I end up going on this trip get my international classification and this, so this was my first ever competition, and it was an international one. And I ended up um, throwing the distance that got me world number one in my classification. Um, and I thought they were joking. When they called out the, like, medal presentation and everything, and they were like, Taylor Quinn, like, from New Zealand, and is now world number one, I was like, someone is playing one big <laughs> prank on me because this shit is just not real. So <laughs> um, obviously confused. Oh, I so was, yeah, and because, like, obviously I was, like, still struggling with anxiety, and they had, like, this, like, really mini, like, media conference after it, just, like, to, like, the local newspaper, and because I was, like, so nervous, they asked me a question, and I was just, like, no comment, and I was, like, why did I say that? <laughs> I was, like, and then, I know, I was, the like, old no I was comment so I know, I was so embarrassed. I was like, oh my God. And I was just like, okay, I'm done. See, how do you I'm feel winning New Zealand now? How do you feel being number one? No comment. Yeah, <laughs> literally, that's what it was. And I was just like, oh, that's so embarrassing for my country, for my family, for myself. I'm going back home. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I was like, okay, no more media for Taylor. That was bad. <laughs> um, 
anyway, trained pretty much full time all of um, 2017 and 18, um, 2019 rolls around, and it was um, so, so I was quite trying to qualify for world champs, um, which were in 2019. So I rocked up to New Zealand nationals. Hadn't had the best of run-ins with my training and everything. Had to swap coaches like three weeks out <laughs> from nationals, which is like a pretty big like upset to happen like three weeks out from like one of the major competitions. Um, anyway, it was just kind of at a point where I was like, okay, I know what I'm capable of. I know I can do it. It's all good. Just chill out, have fun and see what happens. Um Anyway, compete at nationals and end up um, throwing a distance that um, broke the world record um, and qualified for worlds as well, which was so cool. Like, I was not expecting it. I didn't even know what, like, I was so new to the sport that I didn't even know what the world record was in my classification. And again, I was like, nah, this, like, this doesn't happen to people, you know, like, this does not happen to people, like, so quickly. Um, and so I was, like, super excited and everything. Um, and then I got injured about a month or two after that. Um, and I was about four months out from Worlds. So I had to make the decision whether I was going to just train through and like possibly have to deal with this injury for the rest of my life. Or was I going to stop and take some time out and heal and then go to Worlds um, like untrained pretty much. Um, and so I took some time off. And while I was taking that time off, I just realized that I was like a lot happier and a lot um I guess I didn't realize that my mental health was going downhill again and I never went into this I never went into athletics or shot put um to be world number one or to break a world record like that was just stuff that happened <laughs> you know I didn't like have that in the back of my mind like I'm training for this I'm training to get here I'm training to do this and everything you know and that's what people were telling me all around me they're like you're going to go to the Paralympics you're going to get a gold medal you're going to do all this and I was like yeah that's cool and everything but I'm just doing this because I'm alive and I'm lucky to be alive and like I enjoy it um and so over the injury break I was just like I'm really not enjoying athletics anymore and so I decided to call it quits and it was the best decision I ever made so yeah, yeah. oh at least you worked that out pretty early and yeah uh, went from and there. also I didn't want to be in a position where um I was going to give more of my time to the sport when I wasn't happy and I also didn't want people to invest in me like sponsors and everything when I wasn't happy and I couldn't say that I was going to give it my best when I wasn't in the best mindset and headspace if that makes sense so yeah, for sure um yeah yeah, that makes sense. Um, when was that your first time in Australia? No, no, was we um, I my parents took me over to um, Great Barrier Island when I was like two or three or something. Yeah. Um. Oh, one of was it? No, I don't think it was Great Barrier. It was one of the islands. Um, and then we've been to the Gold Coast heaps. Um, Gold Coast is a good Sydney. spot. Oh, I love yeah. the Gold Coast. Yeah. yeah, super fun. All the theme parks was always, like, so fun when we went over there as kids and stuff. Although I'm traumatised from Whitewater World, like, never going back there in my life. Really? Um, I used, I used I to went... work there when I was 19, playing in the under Oh, my God. Oh, you're... So, you know that slide that drops, like, you're standing in it, and it yeah. drops from underneath you? Yeah. Worst bloody experience of my life. Never <laughs> doing it again. Like, honestly... I could not breathe the whole way down and I thought I was going to die, but I didn't. <laughs> May have been over-exaggerating a bit, but like, oh my God, the fear that ran through my body on that ride. <laughs> I think it's um, my brother-in-law. He's uh, he close to 30 now, um, over 30 now. I think we went to that same slide a couple of years ago, yeah. uh, just off topic a little bit. Um, and because there's two of them, um, yeah. my, my sister told him in front, he never wanted to do it. And my sister to ask him to do it in front of the whole family. So he had no, cho oh, no choice but no. to actually go and do it. Um, so I'll, I'll certainly be showing him this, uh, this part. Uh, I want to put him on the spot a bit because um, he loves to give me a lot of shit. But, oh, uh, my God. I, I'm pretty sure they had an argument after that for <laughs> <laughs> And making him do it, so Dan. That's so bad. Yeah, that's this, the this worst when you. you're forced into it as well, <laughs> and you already know you don't want to do it, and like people are forcing you, and it's like, okay, okay, I'll do it, and then it just ends up being so much worse than what you thought it was going to be. Yeah, it's um, <laughs> yeah, I used to love working at that place. Um, 
what Waterworld uh, it's yeah. called. Um, I think it uh, certainly defined uh, uh, some part of my career, I reckon. Yeah. I used to wake up uh, in under 20s, go to training at like um, six, 5, 6 a.m. Yeah. And then go to what Waterworld, work from 8 till 4 and then rush off back to training in the afternoon. Sure. Yeah. That's a long day. Yeah, um, yeah, I think a lot of the under twenties guys had to do some form of work or study. Yeah. So, but anyway, but what a place to work though! How fun was that? Watching people scream and feel like they're gonna. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it was it was fun for about two three weeks, and then because uh, the octopus More ride, yeah, the octopus one, I think it's called um, the one with the eight slides where you race. Oh yeah, that one. Yeah, that one I didn't like working on because you tell everyone to wait, um, and they wouldn't. They wouldn't wait and go, and I'd be like, yeah. <laughs> Uh, I think uh, I think my time's up at this place. Oh my god! I <laughs> maybe like I wasn't that. maybe I wasn't um, uh, commanding enough. But anyway, so good. Uh, <laughs> anyway, there's a little bit of interesting facts for you for you guys um, <laughs> who didn't know me before playing first grade. Um, so I like to ask a little bit of um, fun rapid fire questions. Mm-hmm. The first one is: um, Did you ever have a pre-competition ritual before you went and oh people are gonna drag me for this one um but (laughs) oh they might not but um when I so before I broke the world record the first time in shot put and again when I broke it the second time um the only song I listened to before I went on like about 20 minutes like just the whole 20 minutes before I went on was um Sweet Home Alabama by Lemon (laughs) Skinner For 20 minutes straight, on repeat. <laughs> I don't know why. I didn't even like country music at the time. And this was before country music was like in, because you know how country music is like in at the moment? Yeah. Like this was five years ago. And I don't know why, but something about it was really calmed me. And so I'd listen to it for like 20 minutes on repeat. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> uh, what's your favorite type of uh, gym music? I'm, I'm guessing um, it's... Um, not country or is it country? I feel I feel like country's a bit slow for like workout music. I really like up tempo stuff. Um I like a lot of um uh, just like fast music. I don't like have the genre but just like really up tempo, like the generic Spotify gym playlists yeah. of what I listen to. Yeah. Do you have a favorite saying or quote? Um, I have a couple, but one that I'm really um, pushing at the moment is if is if I can do it, then so can you, and um, no one is you, and that is your power. Oh, nice. I like that. That's the first time I've ever heard that one. Yeah, it's a good one. <laughs> um, if you were to describe yourself in one word. <sighs> Don't do this to me. <laughs> I'll give you, I'll, can I have three? I'll, uh, yeah, you can have yeah, you can have three. Okay, okay. So three words to describe myself. Yeah. Um, fun, sarcastic, and confident. Nice. Very sarcastic. <laughs> uh, uh, I, I couldn't tell. <laughs> um, if there's an animal that best describes your positive attitude, uh, what would that animal be? Um, probably a dolphin. Oh, nice. Yes. I can't, I can't, I'm not as flexible as a dolphin and I can't move like a dolphin, but I feel like dolphins are very like carefree and they love the water because obviously they live in the water. Yeah. They look like a lot of fun um, too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, definitely a dolphin. What's your favorite meal? Um, I love katsubi. Do you guys have that in Australia? What, what's it called? Katsubi. It's like a Japanese, um, how would I describe that? It's like a Japanese, like I love like Asian food. Um, well, I like Asian food and Mexican food, but um, katsubi is like this Japanese dish and it's rice, salads um, and everything. And then um, like like teriyaki chicken or sweet and chili chicken. I don't know. It's like, I'll have to send you a link to their website and so you can see if you've got it in Australia, but it's like my fave go-to. Yeah, it is. You've nearly sold me on that. Uh, it's only 11 a.m. here, but I'm getting hungry. <laughs> um, where's your favorite spot to visit in New Zealand? Oh, 
Um, I definitely love Christchurch. Christchurch will always be home for me. Um, but Raglan is beautiful, a really nice like surf town, super cultural. Um, and I really love it there. Um, Northland, is, have you ever been to New Zealand before? I've, I've been to uh, Auckland because uh, whenever we play the Warriors oh, there. Um, yeah. I did do a trip away with a couple of the uh, lads to Queenstown. That's a beautiful yeah, spot. Yeah, Queenstown is super nice, but that's like a very like generic touristy spot. Like it's it's like super. Oh, don't get me wrong, Queenstown's like stunning, but um, if you ever come to New Zealand, I'd definitely suggest going up north to Northland and the far north. So like um, Whangarei, Kaihia, um, up those ways, because just some of the most amazing oceans um, and just like just so beautiful up there, and like the culture is amazing up there, and yeah, really really nice. And you mentioned Raglan. That's Jordan Ricky's place of birth, I believe it was. I think I think you mentioned that. Is it? Yeah, I think. Uh, I thought he was a Christchurch boy, or was I wrong about that? Um, I'll have to listen to the podcast again. <laughs> um, just the Raglan sounded real familiar, uh, but that's uh, yeah. It's, well, it's it's super nice there. Yeah. Just before we wrap up, I want to talk a few uh, about uh, things about your uh, public speaking engagements. I think you've done a few talks with a few uh, rugby teams or a few sporting teams. Yep. Um, you mentioned yesterday that you were you know, still nervous about public speaking. How did you find that yep. um, talking in front of those teams? Um, <laughs> well, I think I told you the other day, but my first ever, so like before I did anything, my first ever speaking gig was in front of the North Harbour Night of 10 um, men's team. And I was only about 20 at the time. And when you put a shy little 20-year-old girl in front of a group of fully grown men who are also rugby players, like, it scared the living daylight Mm -hmm. out of me. I'm not kidding you. I was shitting myself. I was so close to, like, calling and being like, sorry, I can't come anymore. Like, I'm not doing it. But, yeah, that was definitely a definitive moment in my life where I was like, okay, this is – something that I want to get better at and it's something I want to pursue um it was super like scary for like the first 10 minutes um but as I got into it and like they were all so lovely like the loveliest group of people ever um and then like some of their management staff was in with them as well and um just like such a lovely environment to be in um and yeah it it got easier probably wasn't my best talk I've ever done um but yeah, just and I still like talk to some of the guys now, and they because um, my sister's boyfriend plays um, for a club here on the North Shore in Auckland, and they play for clubs here on the North Shore. So whenever we see each other, we always say hi and like ask how everyone's doing and everything. So like just really formed a lot of amazing connections through that first ever talk. So um, that was like really cool, and then went down to the Crusaders that same year, a couple months after, and did that again. And I was in the same mindset. I was like, why am I doing this to myself again? Why did I say that I would do this again? I don't want to do it anymore. Um, and this was like an even bigger group because it was their pre-season training squad as well. That so was their um, super rugby squad and their pre-season squad. Do you remember, what, what, I, you, what, do you remember what you said to them? This is a big rugby team in New Zealand, right? The Crusaders. Yeah. Yeah, um, I do sort of, um, and I've always said to um, uh, the lady who I speak with from the Crusaders that I want to do over because I do so much better now. <laughs> but <laughs> um, it, like again, like the most amazing group of um, people ever, and you like you can go into the like I went into that environment not expecting much, and really learning a lot from them as well. Like you can. Um, it was pretty evident to me why they are so good at what they do and just the processes that they have and the mindset that they all have and really like coming together as a team and everything but they asked amazing questions and um, they were also like um, invested in what I was saying which was really cool like I was expecting some of them to like fall asleep or whatever or like look the other way but they were all just like looking at me the whole time I was like you guys can like look away for a bit if you want like you don't have to keep looking (laughs) Um, uh, but yeah, and then the following day I went and did a training session with them, which was like so much fun. Love that so much. And yeah, I want a do over. So hopefully I'll get a do over hopefully for the next season, which would be cool. Yeah, that would be cool. 
I know you want to get into public speaking. You want to go uh, do talking gigs around. Is there anything that um, you'd like to promote um, or say about you know what you want to do? Well, I think um, for now, especially in kind of a state that not just New Zealand and Australia and at the moment with the whole pandemic, but I think just the world in general, like uh, I'd, there's a, been a lot more talk about mental health in the last couple of years and it's amazing and I love seeing people talk about mental health. But globally, our suicide statistics are still so high, like the highest they've ever been. And so to me, that kind of says that we need to keep doing more and keep talking about it more. And even if it's just sharing something that someone else has posted on their Instagram or saying something to someone else that someone else has said, like, I know it can be super hard to talk about mental health and to especially open up to people who you um, who you are close with about mental health because there's always that fear of judgment or they're not understanding. And um, if you think that someone that you know is going through some sort of mental health struggle, I know it can be hard to know what to say. But even just, like, saying to someone, like, look, it's okay if you're struggling and I'm not entirely sure how I'm going to help you, but just know that I'm here and we can do it together. Like that would do like the world a difference for so many people. Um, like suicide is one of the, like one of the very few like deaths in this world that we can stop because people don't have to take their own lives. And I know we can't save anyone, which like breaks my heart, but um, we can save a lot of people by talking about mental health more and, making it more aware and um, even just talking about our feelings more like it's really not hard we can go to the doctor and talk about us like our physical sicknesses or we can go and get a broken bone looked at but we can't talk about our like emotions which like confuses me a little bit but um it's yeah I wish like I could do a whole podcast on talking about mental health but um I think it's so important to just talk about mental health and even this podcast I think will help uh, well I hope will help a lot of people that may not have felt comfortable talking about mental health or hearing about mental health and starting that kind of get getting the ball rolling and talking about there just talk 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 as much as you can about it um within your training um within your training teams within your playing teams within your rugby community like it doesn't it doesn't matter who you are um where you come from what color skin you have who you love, um, what you believe in, the money you have in your bank, what kind of car you drive, it does not matter. Mental health does not discriminate. Um, and it's super important to be as open as we can about it. For sure. I think uh, I, I just uh, just based off what you're saying there, I read in a book, uh, it's called A Force for Good by Dalai mm-hmm. Lama. Yeah. And he mentioned that over the next 100 years, I think the most important uh, thing will be dialogue. Yeah, people, 100%. people talking to each other, and that certainly um, applies to mental health. Yeah. Um, Taylor, I want to thank you for being a guest on this podcast. Um, and I've this has opened my mind up to a whole new world of uh, awareness. Um, I know people talk about bullying and stuff in primary school, but it, I haven't spoken to anyone in depth about it. Uh, so that certainly opened up my mind to, to that side. You, know, you shared uh, briefly about the sexual assault, rape. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, just being able to express that and make others feel like um, they can express themselves and, you know, they can talk to other people about it. I think that's going to be of huge value to uh, plenty of people listening in. Well, thank you for having me. Um, yeah, I'm really grateful for the opportunity. And like you said, I hope this helps people from all walks and corners of life so um yeah super grateful and thank you so much thanks Taylor. Thank you. if you've enjoyed this episode then i'd love if you would hit that subscribe button leave a comment or a review and share it with anyone you think might enjoy it as well for more behind the scenes content head to my instagram at davidmead411 and feel free to slide into my dms if there's anyone you would love to hear from I can't wait to bring you another episode next week and thanks for listening to the David Mead Podcast.